And just to remind you, we are we have this week of uh, lecture, then next week, and then the week after that we have our first exam. So just remember that uh, we're going to have our first exam uh, this month. So this lecture is lecture number two. Uh, the project manager, project team, and the project organization module. Uh, we're going to be discussing uh, specifically for this topic different type of project uh, organization uh, companies and how the structure of the company can affect the development of the project. So in terms of the objectives for the for the let for the class. Um, we have these six major objectives. At this point, we're covering these two. So be familiar with the project management body of knowledge and understand the applications, issues, and current development in project management. So the agenda, again, we have three major topics. The first one is the, the manager's role. Then we're going to talk about the project manager's manager responsibilities to the project, which include three major uh, responsibilities, fighting fires and obstacles, leadership and making trade-offs, and negotiation, conflict resolution, and persuasion. So we talk about conflict resolution already in this class, and you're going to see how that fits into, into this topic. And the last topic is fitting project into the parent organization. So for this, we need to understand the different um, organizations that we can find in a company. Uh, it could be pure project organization, can also be functional project organization, matrix project organization, or a mix between these three. So the objectives, the learning objectives for this class, or this lecture in particular, is to understand the roles of project managers and contrast these roles with the, those of traditional managers. Understand the need to adopt the system approach to managing decisions. Any one of you who is familiar with what is systems, systems engineering, or systems approach? So we're going to talk about that um, in this lecture. Actually, um, there's right now there's a movement in terms of industrial engineering and the degree of industrial engineering. Mold, um, there are several programs in the country that are moving towards a systems engineering approach instead of industrial engineering approach. So um, if you're planning to go to work for the government, for instance, um, the Army or any other type of uh, government agency, they look for this type of mentality, like people are trained using the systems approach. So you will, you will, we will talk about that and you will see why it is, is important. And understand the project manager's responsibilities to the project and, and differentiate between the pure project organizations, functional project organizations, and matrix projects organizations. So let's start with the manager, the organization, and the team. <laughs> So once a project is, is selected or is decided to pursue a project in the company, the next step for senior management is to choose the, the project manager. So, so who's going to be in charge of this project? Um, these decisions are usually made before uh, getting the project, but the more typical case is that the selection is announced following a meeting between the senior management and the prospective project manager. So you, most of the time, they have several options. They want to find out what is the best fit for this project. So senior management will have a meeting with, with the candidates, and then they will announce uh, which person is going to be the selected to pursue uh, the project. So what is the project manager role? So to understand the roles of a project manager is important to understand the difference between a project manager and a functional manager. So the head of the functions, such as manufacturing, direct the activities of a well-established unit or department of the firm. So I was hired, my first job was a supervisor. 
and in most of the most of the tasks that I was in charge of was basically supervising the operation of the manufacturing line, make sure that the uh, orders were completed, make sure that the employees were there to complete their hours, make sure that the machines were working well, that they were receiving the right maintenance, and so on. So the everything was well established. I knew what I needed to do, and there was no um, no major challenge. I will say, if nothing. Uh, unexpected happened. So if machines, uh, the machines were working okay, then there were not any major thing that I needed to do just to make sure that everything was completed on time. So the functional manager's role, therefore, is mainly of a supervisor. So you'll be there, you'll be supervising, we'll be making sure that everything is running as expected, and then you will report to your supervisor um, by the end of the week or by the end of the month, uh, telling them what was going on, the number of units that you produce, and if anything unexpected happened. Um, so, on the other hand, most projects are multidisciplinary, so the project manager rarely has technical competence in more than one or two of the several technologies involved in the project. So, as we talked earlier in this class, you'll see that you have multiple engineers, multiple uh, people working on the same project in order to take it to completion. But the project manager will have some technological knowledge on some areas. Well, he will not be able, you as a project manager will not know a lot about electrical engineers, for instance. But you're going to be uh, managing people who are have a strong background in that area. So that's one of the things that you need to, to know. So the project manager Manager is not a competent overseer in all areas and thus has a different role. So the project manager role is a facilitator. Okay? So you as a project manager, you you will become a facilitator to the people working in the project. So the project manager ensure that those involved involved on the project have the knowledge and resources to accomplish their assigned responsibilities. You need to make sure that the right people is placed in the right place so they can accomplish what was expected. The project manager uses the system approach and the traditional manager adopts the analytical approach to solving projects, problems. So what's the difference between these two approach? approaches? The analytical approach basically centers on understanding the bits and the pieces in a system. So you can look at the manufacturing line. You see you have these many workers, you have these many machines, and you need to accomplish these many units by the end of the week. Maybe you can uh, create a model an analytical model that will tell you how many chips you need to run in order to accomplish that number of units by the end of the week. Let's say a linear programming model, or a simulation model, or any other type of model, any other type of analytical model, in order to make you able to make those decisions. Now, on the system approach, it includes the study of the bits and pieces, understanding how they fit together, how they interact, and how they affect and affect are affected by the environment. So from when you talk about the systems approach, then you're looking at the problem at the project from a larger perspective. You're not only look, focusing on, on, on the specific, you also are focusing on how your project is going to affect the other pieces in the company. So uh, so that's the major difference. On the analytical approach, you're focusing on, on, on the specific on the specific area. From the system perspective, you're looking at how your project is going to affect the company and also is going to affect the subsystems that are under your project. And that approach allows you to make uh, decisions that are going to help the company in the long run. So, traditionally, managers 
uh, his or her group, a subsystem of the organization with a desire to optimize the group performance. So you want to make sure that you are able to produce as many units as possible. The systems approach manager conducts the group so that it contributes to the total system optimization. So, for example, if you if you need to if you're supervising a production line, you want to make this production line produce as many units as possible. You want to optimize the number of units that you can produce. So you want to, right now you're producing 300 units per week. You want to take that to 450 units. In order to make that happen, you have to bring resources from other places. So maybe add another machine or maybe run an extra chip. But what can happen is, if you need to bring resources from other units, then you're going to be taking some of the resources from another area, and that might um, reduce the output of that other area. So in the long run, you're optimizing your, your group, but you are also affecting the company um, in another way because you're basically reducing the output of another area. When you look at the system approach, you're making the decisions such like you're you're making those decisions for your project, but you're also making those decisions for the company uh, overall. Um, so when we look at the specific of the traditional manage, managers, uh, if you're trying to optimize the group performance, this is uh, an example that I uh, I like to show. So if you're focusing only on the uh, this is for a design of a missile from the viewpoint of different specialists. So if you're going to optimize only the aerodynamics, then this is the best design that you're going to come. But if you are going to focus only on propulsion, this is your, your best design. Um, structure, this is going to be your, your best design, and so on. So if you look only at the benefits from your point of view, then your design will be totally different. But at the end, the system is not going to be performing uh, well overall. So you have to come up with the best design that accommodates all the viewpoints of the company, or in this case, of the project. And that's what the systems uh, approach does. So the systems approach, to be successful, the project manager must adopt the systems approach. The system, a project exists as a subsystem of a larger system, a program that is subsistent in the larger system. So when we're talking about, let's say, we consider our project a system. So that project is going to be here at this point of the pyramid. So the decisions that are made here are going to affect the subsystems and the component levels but also I'm going to affect the system of systems. So in this case, I remember in our first lecture, we talk about the combination of projects that's called a program. So when we talk about systems of systems, we're talking about the program, the overall group of projects that the company has. And at the end, it's going to affect also the enterprise. So the way to manage your system is going to affect the subsystems and the components and also the the enterprise overall. So that's why it's important to have the systems approach because you want to make the decisions that are going to be the best for the company. Yes. Sir. So does the analytical approach just stop the system? Say that again. Does the analytical approach just stop the system? The analytical approach is the approach that you know that most of the traditional managers follow. Um, um, you can follow that approach at any level, actually. But what we're saying is. If you want to be a good project manager, you need to have a different way of seeing things. You want to make your decisions in such a way that you can understand. Like, the main yeah. So the main difference between the analytical and the systems approach is that for an analytical approach, you're going to be focusing only on your area. Okay, so the decisions that you're going to be making are just going to be based on what's best for your area, what's based for your manufacturing production line. Uh, whereas if you're looking at the system approach, you're going to make the same decisions, but now you're going to be looking at how would that affect the overall system. 
how it would that affect the enterprise? If you're going to bring resources from somewhere else, is that going to be good for the company or not? So if you make your decisions only looking at, the, at your area, then that would be the best decision for you, but they might not be the best decision for the company overall. Okay? That's a good question. Any any other question? Okay, so projects objectives influence the nature of the task. So the task influence the nature of the subtask, the organization influence the nature of the project. So the project manager must understand the influence and their impact on the project and its delivery. So as a project manager, you should be able to understand what the system's approach is and you need to follow or adopt this system approach while making your decisions. Project manager must be a person who can handle responsibility. It's going to be responsible to the project team, senior management, and to the client. So you're going to be dealing with these three uh, components. Your project team, the project team that you're supervising, the senior management who is expecting some output from your project, and the client, which is also requesting some uh, output for, for their benefit. So, for example, here we have the Central Arizona project. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but this is just a... a project that moves water from the Colorado River to some areas in Arizona. So it's a public utility, move water from the Colorado River to Phoenix, several other uh, Arizona municipalities, and some American Indian reservations. Uh, the water is transported by a system of aqueducts, receivers, pipes, and pumping stations. So I think that this not very clear, we have several pumping stations around the afternoon. Almost everything done by this company is a project. Uh, most of the projects are devoted to the construction, repair, and maintenance of their system. So this is a very large project, and maintaining this project is will, will demand several things, and these things are managed as projects. So, now consider the uh, project manager responsibilities for such type of project. So, a maintenance team needs resources in a timely fashion so that maintenance can be carried out according to a schedule. So, if something happens, this is a very important resource. People need water. So, you want to make those decisions as soon as possible. You want to have the resources available so you can go perform the maintenance when needed. Uh, the project manager clients are municipalities. Drinking public water is a highly interested stakeholder. The system is even subject to political turmoil because um, this issue of water can be used as uh, what in politics, but yeah, it could change the, the way people think if you are not able to deliver as expected. And the project manager is in the middle of this uh, model of responsibility and must manage the project in the face of all these conflicting interests. So as you can see, you're going to be dealing, as a project manager, you're going to be dealing with multiple things. You have to be responsible. You have to make sure that you are organized. You're making the decisions on time, and you have everything, and all the important people involved in the decisions that you're making. So, another role, important role in project manager is that you're a communicator. And here we have a different, again, different people 
uh, involved in the project. So you have your project team, you have the senior manager or management, and you have the client. And you might also have some outside interested uh, parties. So you need to communicate with these people. Okay? So as you can see, you have a direct line for communication between the client and the project manager, direct line between the project team and the project manager, also with the senior management management, and also with the outside interested parties. But what happened? These people also communicate. So you, you cannot control the information that is passed between the project team and the senior management, the client and the senior management, and the outside interest parties to the project team and so on. So what happened? That can create a communication problem. So the solid lines uh, denote the project manager's communication channel. So again, you have direct communication channels between the people involved in the project. Um, the dotted lines denote you know, communication paths for the other parties at interest in the project. And problems arise when some of the parties propagate communication that might mislead the other parties. So it's the project manager's responsibility to introduce order. So the best way you can manage this is to have a communication um, with all the parties involved. This communication needs to happen frequently. You don't want to get surprises, especially for the senior management. Another project manager role is to be a virtual project manager. So some project teams are geographically dispersed. And if you remember, uh, one of the examples that we discussed in class was the Airbus 380. So I think I have that example here. So you have a project that is geographically dispersed, and you need to make sure that everything happens at a certain point so you can get your final assembly on that location. So long distance communication is commonplace and no longer uh, expensive. You can have a group of people talking through video chat using Google Plus, for instance, for free. Um, the problem is that written and voice-only communication lacks the feedback component that let us know if our messages are received and with what level of acceptance. So if you're only managing communication through email and through phone, then you're missing that feedback that is only, you're able, you're only able to receive when you're looking at the person. So for virtual projects to succeed, communication between the project manager and the project team must be frequent, open, and two-way. So we have again the, the example here. Now in terms of senior manager, it is the project manager's job to keep the senior management up to date on the state of the project. Uh, a good advice is never let the boss be surprised. So if something happened, project happened, problem happened, um, you want to be the person who notify your boss or the senior management. You don't want people outside uh, or maybe inside your group to be the ones who inform or provide the wrong information to senior management. Uh, senior management must be informed about a problem in order to assist in its solution. The timing of this information to be at the earliest point, a problem seems likely to occur. So if you are, if you are behind schedule and you know you're not going to be able to complete your project on time, as soon as you find out that you are behind schedule, you need to notify your team management. Um, 
I know it sounds kind of, uh, you don't want to look like you are not doing your job, but most of the time, these uh, still happen because for things that are out of your control. So if it's not your fault, then you can let the senior management know of oh, this happened, of uh, this uh, provider were not able to deliver this product on time, so this will take our um, timeline, will we'll get behind for one week, for instance. So if, I, if these things are out of your control, I don't see why you will have a problem. Okay? But if something that is on your fault, then, then yeah, you need to figure out, figure out what will be the best way to communicate that. Okay? So the client, the project manager is also responsible to the client. Cost, schedule, and scope changes are the most common outcome of client intersection. So as we discussed for for the project on on Las Vegas, you saw there were some changes based on the clients. Um, design changes, most of them, and that end up costing a lot of money. So these changes could happen. Uh, the cost of these changes often exceed the client's expectations. So once you know, once they made this request, you need to be able to tell them, okay, this is going to cost you more, um, about this amount, amount of money. Most of the time, they're going to complain. They want to make those changes, and they don't want to see an extra charge for that. You need to be aware of that. So the project team, project management is responsible to the project team, just as team members are responsible to the project manager. Project manager will have people working on the project who are not direct reports. What that means is if you're running a project and you need, you don't have uh, an electrical engineer in your project, but you need an electrical engineer, then you're going to be bringing that person from another group into your project. So that person is not your direct report. You're just using this person to get some of part of the project completed. Um, so the project manager facilitates the work of the team and helps them succeed. The last row is meetings, commoner, and chair. And I think we talk about this briefly. Um, communication with the project team typically takes place in the form of project team meetings. So you you want this time to be useful. You want to make the best use of this time to communicate to your project team. But that requires some planning. So it's not like you're going to, okay, let's schedule a meeting and see how everything is going. No. You're going to schedule a meeting. You need to know what you want to accomplish on that meeting. So make sure that the meeting starts on time and has a prearranged stopping time. So you're going to have a limited time. People are busy. You want to make the best use of, the, of their time. As a commoner of the meeting, the project manager is responsible for taking minutes and keeping the meeting on track. So we talk about taking minutes. That helps you to record all the decisions that are made in the meeting. That helps you also to have some type of evidence of what was discussed in the meeting. So every everyone is on the same boat. You want to make sure that you have those minutes, you share those minutes so everyone has the same information. And if something happened later on, then you can refer back to those meeting minutes. Say, okay, this is what we decide based on the minutes. Okay? So the project manager should also make sure that the invitation to the meeting includes a written agenda. And the agenda. To clearly explain the purpose of the meeting, okay. 
and includes sufficient information on the project. And you can use some of these um, information right now as a student. So if you, you're going to be working on projects with other classmates. So most of the time when you have your, your meetings, if you don't have a clear schedule or an agenda of what you want to do, you're going to end up wasting a lot of time. So if, you, if you're able to say, okay, let's meet this Thursday afternoon, we're going to go over this, 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 and we're going to be done by this time, then I can assure you that you're going to make more progress and you're going to um, use your time efficiently. So if you want to start applying these concepts, you can do it right away. Uh, specifically for your capstan design project, um, this is very important because you're going to be dealing with other uh, classmates. And most of the time, I think the way we are doing it right now is we are not allowing the students to pick, select their team. And the way that it's done right now is that you are, you are group on a team, most likely are not familiar with some of the, uh, the team members. So if you're, if you're able to um, have a specific agenda for one of your meetings, each of your meetings, then you, you will be able to have a more pleasant experience with your caption design. So project manager's responsibilities to the project. Okay, so the responsibilities to the project, the acquisition of resources and personnel. You're responsible to get the right resources and the right people on the right place to complete your project. Dealing with obstacles that arise during the course of the project and exercising the leadership needed to bring the project to a successful conclusion and making the trade-off necessary to do so. So let's talk about the acquisition of resources. So it's the responsibility of the project manager to ensure that the project has the appropriate resources or level of resources. Most human resources come to the project on a temporary assignment. Okay, so you're going to bring uh, people who are not uh, your direct reports to, to this project. The project manager wants uh, are simple, the individual in the organization who is the most competent on the specific task be uh, complete. So you want to, if you have a specific requirement for, for your project, you want to make sure that you bring the, the expert on the area to your project, right? But usually if you're taking that person from, from another area, their direct manager would not be very happy. So people that the functional manager are least happy to release from the departmental job. Well, these people that you are going to be requesting most of the time are very competent, and then they are going to be not going to be easy to to recruit to your project. Most of the time, the workers that the functional manager from another area is prompt to, to give you are not the are usually the ones the project manager would least like to have. So, makes sense, right? You want to keep your best people on on your area, and then if you, if you need to supply some. Of, of your resources, you need to take that person that is not very important. So you need to be aware of that. Um, fighting fires and obstacles early in the project's life cycle, fires are often linked to the need of for resources. So again, this goes back to you're trying to get the best resources. You want to feed the right people to your ta uh, task. So, 
when budget hit cost and the general cost must be transformed into highly specific costs in the quantities of highly specific resources. Uh, as X percent cost must be translated into Y units of this commodity or T hours of that engineering time. So you start with a budget, you have a budget cost, then you will not be able to bring that person that you needed for a specific uh, task. So that can also uh, be reflected at the end in the output of your project. As work on the project progresses, most buyers are associated with technical problems, supplier problems, and client problems. And remember, as soon as these problems happen, you need to make sure that you notify your senior management. Technical problems occur, for example, when some subsystem, computer routine, is supposed to work but fails. So you, you need to run some experiments and you don't have the computer running. Let's say the software that you require to run the experiments was not installed on time, so you would not be able to, I don't know, let's say you need an AutoCAD to design a, a, an area of your project and the software was never installed, then you know that that problem will change the, the timeline of your project. Now, in terms of leadership and making trade-off, uh, project manager is also responsible for making the trade-offs necessary to lead the project to a successful conclusion. Do you remember what were the three more important parts of a project or or the three factors that you're going to be tra making trade off to delivering your project? So one was the, the cost, right? So cost, schedule, and so. Okay, so you have these uh, three areas. You're going to be making trade-off between the cost. So if you need to bring the project back to schedule, you might need to increase the project cost because you will add more resources. But if you cannot increase the cost, then your schedule will be uh, affected because you're going to, not going to be able to finish on schedule. But also the scope, if you have 20 deliverables the deliverables for, for the project, they if you want to finish on schedule without adding more cost, then you might need to change that. You might not be able to satisfy some of them. So those are the three areas in which you can uh, perform some trades. Of the three project goals or the scope, specification and client satisfaction is usually the most important. You want to meet those expectations. You want to make your customer or your client happy. Uh, Schedule is a close second. Most of the time, if you're not able to complete the project on time, your client is not going to be happy. And the cost is usually uh, subordinate to the other two. So most likely, you're going to end up spending more money in order to complete your project. So that's why planning is very important. You want to make sure that you plan, um, taking into account uh, all the factors so that you will not end up having a larger cost for your project. Okay, so the last topic of this lecture is fitting project into the parent organization. And here we're going to talk about the different type of organizations. Um, but first we need to discuss why organizations choose to conduct so much of their work as project. So the first reason, devising product development programs uh, by product design engineering manufacturing Marketing function, functions in 
In one team, not only improve the product, it also allows significant cuts in the time to market for the product. So if you were to were to deal with some a new product and you wanna to take that product to the market as soon as possible, then if you integrate all these areas into a project, you have all these knowledge together, you are uh, you are considering all the areas that are needed to take that product to market in a schedule time, then having all these components together will allow you to, to move faster. In the other, uh, in other way, if you have these resources split around the company and you need to take this product to, uh, to the next step, then you're going to be dealing with asking for that resource or maybe uh, dealing with uh, having that person work on that particular project for some time on the, during the scheduled day. So have, having them integrated together in a project, uh, most of the time helps you to improve the time to deliver your product. For example, in the 1990s, Chrysler, which now is owned by Fiat, cuts 18 months from the new, new product development time required for design to street and produce designs that were widely rated as outstanding. So they were able to cut that time. They were able to be uh, were able to be successful by taking those products out faster than, than our competitors. These brought new price and order to the market much faster than normal in the automotive industry. So in the 90s, this model was very popular, the PT Cruiser. Why organizations choose to conduct some most of their work as project? The second reason, the product development design process requires input from different areas of a specialized knowledge. The exact mix of knowledge varies from product to product or service to service. And team of specialists can be formed, do their work, and then disband. So that's one of the advantages of having project. You can group these people, make them focus on this project, then after they're done, they can go back to their respective areas. The third reason, the explosive expansion of technical capabilities is almost every area of the organization thanks to the Stabilize the structure of the enterprise. The, this movement of having more technical capabilities and to catch up with the technology usually uh, moves faster than the, the organization itself. So traditional organizations have difficulty dealing with rapid, large-scale change, but private organizations can. For reason, many upper level managers we know lack confidence in their ability to cope with and respond to such rapid change in their organizations. So organizing, organizing these changes as projects gives the manager some sense of accountability and control. And the fifth reason, the rapid growth of globalized industry often involves the integration of activities carried out by different firms located in different countries. So again, going back to the Airbus 380, we have different firms producing different parts of the airplane located in different countries. Organizing such activities into a project improves the firm's ability to ensure overall compliance with the laws and regulations. So these activities are happening in different countries. If you are able to organize those activities as project, then you, you will have people focusing on their laws and 
regulation on a particular country, satisfying those laws, satisfying those regulations, and also um, bringing those components to where you need them. All of these factors offers the expanded use of projects. In traditional ways of organizing projects were too costly and too slow, largely because of how they link to the patent firm. So the in increment or increasing use in, in projects um, foster the development of new structures within company. So now you have some companies that are more focusing on project and they have a organization that is built uh, dealing with most of the time dealing with projects. But there's also some of the companies that are structured on a different way. So that's why it's important to you to understand how the firm that you're working on is structured and how would that affect your, your project. So the first type of organization is called the pure project organization. So you have a president, then you have a program manager. So again, program is a combination of projects. And you have uh, multiple projects under the program manager. So you have manager project A, manager project B, and each project will have marketing, manufacturing, R&D, finance, and personnel within the project. So this is called a pure project organization. The project manager is the CEO of the project, so he's going to be in charge of, of that project. That's going to be uh, the project manager baby. When the project is completed, accepted by the client, equipment return, and local workers uh, paid off, then the project manager and specialist return to their current firm and wait for the next job. For large projects, the project, the pure project organization is effective and efficient, but for small projects, it's a very expensive way to operate. So the drawback, they have a broad range of specialists, but they have a limited technological depth. So if you go back here to the organization, you might have a lot of specialists, but they might, might be trained on different areas, but they will not have a lot of depth in terms of having the knowledge on mm, Nano manufacturing, for instance. Um, if you if you do have one, then that resource is going to be uh, shared with all the projects, so that will be very difficult to to arrange if you want to use it in multiple projects. So that's one of the drawbacks about this type of organization. If the project resident specialist is in, in a given area of knowledge happen to be lacking in a specific subject of the area, the project must hire a consultant and another Specialist or do without.
If the parent organization has several concurrent pure projects drawing on the same specialty areas, then they develop fairly high levels of duplication. in these specialties. And all that is translated into one thing, money, and this is very expensive. So if you have only one person which is a specialist on an area and then you need another project with that, yes sir. Yeah, so, for example, uh, I was talking about nanotechnology. So, if you have multiple projects that require a resource that is an expert on nanotechnology, right now we know those, uh, that is a new area, so those resources will be very limited. So, let's say your company um, has one person who is an specialist in that area. Let's say you have two projects at the same time requiring the same resource then you only have one person with that technological debt, but at the same time you need that same person for multiple projects. So at that point then, these are the options that you, you can have. You can hire a consultant to bring that person to another uh, project, but also you can hire another person, but in the case that you will not need that resource in the future, then that will create some duplication that will cost you extra money. Yeah, that's like Oh, about the peer project organization. Um, there are multiple, I would say, first construction companies will be one of them that they operate based on different projects depending on what they need to, to build. Um, in terms of um, consulting companies, this is more related to industrial engineering. So there's multiple firms, I don't remember any names right now, but they they work um, depending on the needs of the, of the industry. So you can have people working for Johnson Johnson, one group working for Berg, another group working for uh, Stryker, and so on. So that could be another another type of example. Any any other question? Okay, so um, I'm going to stop here. Next time we're going to talk about functional and matrix organizations. And we're going to also have our second case study.